everybody. Hello, world. This is Kara St. Louis. And that right there, that's Maria Wheatley. I know. We've not been in the same, despite the fact that we do so much work together, and we are actually really good friends, this is the first time since we've captured on film together. I think that's important and worth noting. Anyway, so this is the Patreon series of, uh, of interviews. Uh, this would be number four, the fourth in the series. As I've said, this is my friend and colleague and somebody I adore, Maria Wheatley. She is thoroughly versed in the esoteric nature of divining, of water, of the megalith, of all of those wonderful things. And I do have to say it because I tease her about this all the time. She probably doesn't remember, but I do. Um, the reason we've not been on film together is because it's like working with Indiana Jones. She's constantly under the ground somewhere which we can't get Wi-Fi. <laughs> which, is, which is what I tell people. I, I'm like, yeah, I hope so. But she's usually underground, so I don't know. Anyway, that's what I love about you, though. I really do. Okay, that's where she gets, I mean, see, this is the thing about Maria. She, she really does her research. She goes places. She checks stuff out. She touches things, you know, and she tries to um, tries to get a real physical idea of what's going on, and then she uses this intuition that she has, this, uh, you know, this connection to the earth and to the water and her clairvoyance, and um, that combination produces some pretty powerful research, so I've always counted myself unbelievably fortunate that she works with me. It's great. Ah. Anyway, hi, Maria. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Listen, there are some things I want to talk about with Maria today. What, uh, the one I want to start off with is the fact that she's got this new book coming out very, very soon. I'm, I'm just dying to see it. I'm dying to hear about it. Um, it's not quite ready yet, but it, it's almost ready. She's got a cover. She's going to send it to me, and I will put it on my page, and I will put it on Patreon with the link to this interview with it. Okay, most of you who are going to be watching this on the Patreon site have all the information about this trip that she and I are taking. So you'll see lots and lots of beautiful visuals that go along with them. Um, that's another thing about Maria. There's a lot of beauty that goes along with working with her. Okay, so Maria, tell us about the book that's coming. Yeah, well, the, the book that's uh, coming out, it'll be uh, launched on the 25th of January next year. It's being published by the late and great Dolores Cannon's publishing company, Ozark Mountain Publishing. Uh, and I'm, I was always a fan of Dolores being a past life regression therapist myself, although I didn't train with Dolores. I had already been trained by the time I met her. And I was also a guide for Dolores going to Stonehenge, Avebury and Glastonbury and places. Basically, uh, about sort of eight years ago now, I was at a, an ancient site near Stonehenge called the Codford Circle, which is an Iron Age Druidic ceremonial astronomical site. Mm -hmm. Now, I was there and I was just kind of walking around and, you know, feeling quite good and it was a nice day. So I went to the, the center and sat down and then within a sort of a couple of moments a couple of minutes i just got like this bang bang this this download of how the the druids used to create this branch of astrology to ascertain our past lives and our spiritual heritage by transforming the round circular natal birth chart horoscope into a six-pointed star which represents the heart chakra which the heart chakra has a six pointed star and then 12 vermilion petals going all the way around. And any planets that fall in particular sectors of your birth chart are placed within this six pointed star, which represents your most significant past lives. And I, I told Dolores about this when dearest Dolores was alive and, uh, and she was very interested uh, in it. And, 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 it's, and it's being published by, by their publishing house. So I'm absolutely thrilled. And it, it takes you through the pl different planets represent different genders and places and that type of thing. Are you doing readings based on this? Are you doing work with people with this system? 
Yeah, I've I've been doing readings for uh, for the past eight years with uh, with but, this. But not with this with this system. Oh wow! I had no. I thought you know, there's so many things that you can do during readings on. I had no idea it was this new astrology system as well. Wow. Yes, I mean the one thing you know that uh, Dolores she didn't suffer falls gladly at all. Right. She was very very down to earth, and so uh, so I I did a chart for her then PA lady, and it was quite remarkable because what Dolores had personally got in her regression of her PA lady, mm -hmm. I got through the Soul Star chart. So they were very very similar. So I think that was a bit of a, a green light for for the book there. <laughs> Definitely. And the, so what's the title, did you say? Yeah, the title of the book's going to be Druidic uh, Soul Star Astrology, because that's what the, the ancient Druid, which I felt was a, like a guide there at this ancient site, uh -huh. I wanted it to be called. And so, yeah, so I kept to their, their tradition. That's beautiful. I can't wait to see the cover. I can't wait to get it. This is an amazing turning point for you. This is a real sort of, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking uh, forward to it because um, with that, I've also uh, been developing some astrological software so that anybody that doesn't really want to go through the process themselves of transforming their own birth chart, but it's really easy. Yeah. For those that don't want uh, to do that, you can just uh, have the software and start doing it for your friends and your family by just putting in the date and the place of birth and the whole, you'll get your birth chart next to your soul star druidic chart. So That's you'll be able to see at a glance. So is the software going to be available sort of concurrently with the book then? Hopefully so, yes. Great. Great. I'll take one. <laughs> <laughs> Super, that's fantastic. Okay, now, Maria has given me, there's a, just a couple of things we want to talk about. There's, first of all, we're doing a tour together in June that I'm so excited about. It's the Solstice Tour, and Maria and I are bearing down on it, bringing our own things, you know, with us, and she's, she's going to talk about, uh, because, you know, Maria knows, deeply knows, most of the megalithic sites and spiritual sites really in Europe wouldn't you say Maria would you say you're pretty well versed in all of Europe yeah yeah I've yeah. I've, I've been around to lots of different sites mm. several times like Ireland I've been there quite a few times now and I right. have uh, really got to know and befriend and understand some of the esoteric um, metaphysical energies right. there and how the sites resonate and affect us and affect our consciousness and this is what i'm going to really enjoy going to ireland with you cara because we, we've chosen between us some of the the finest sites that uh that resonate feminine and some masculine energies right. that we can really tap into and, and explore together with with right. the group yeah i actually i really can't wait and it's also an opportunity for me to do to take pieces of my Fay research and my Fay lecture and deliver them actually in on site. I mean, I expect the Fay will join us and go with us the entire time that we're there because don't you feel that, Maria? I mean, I can feel like shivers going up my back right now. It's um, it's going to be a pretty potent and powerful outing between the two of us. So, but before, you know, um, I asked Maria to talk about the, the roots, the sites, all of those sorts of things with her expertise, but I, I, I want to sort of end with that because I want to end on this beautiful, positive, magical, you know, journey. She has agreed, though, to talk about something, her, give me her opinion about the, uh, some of the stuff that's been coming up recently in, in, um, as a result, not as a result, uh, concurrently, let's say, concurrently with some of these what can only be called in my view manufactured weather events that have been going on around the world but largely very near the united states the southern united states it's been very convenient to have these hurricanes you know generated there because it's expected this time of year there it's just that they're not natural they're not normal and uh you know most of uh, most of us can clearly see that they're that they're fabricated um, but the one thing I wanted to ask Maria as a person who is uh, a real magician, and, and I'm not saying that lightly, um, when it comes to water and understanding water and the, the consciousness of water, 
you'll have, you will have noticed that um, along with these hurricanes, there have been reports of drainage of the ocean gone, just disappeared for that for a lot for um, a very wide swaths of of shoreline around a lot of these areas where the hurricanes have appeared. This is completely un unnatural. It's not an earthquake followed by a tsunami. It's a hurricane. Hurricanes don't generally cause the ocean to disappear. So I asked Maria to talk to us a little bit about what she thinks that is. What is happening there, Maria? Well, one thing I've noticed, uh, generally speaking, in the area in which I live, which is uh, in the southwest of England, uh, in, the, in the Wessex counties, is that over uh, the course of the past sort of 20, 25 years, it seems to be very clear that the water is behaving differently. Yeah. Okay. So we need to think of water, as you are aware, and many of your listeners are probably aware that water is conscious, it's sentient, it has it has its own mind, it has its own resonance, it has its own understanding. Mm -hmm. And some of the waters of the world are very, very old. I mean, for example, just up the road uh, from Marlborough, where I live in a place called Avery, you've got some wells bored. Uh, up to about 40 years ago and they hit aquifers that are up to 30,000 years old and they're tapping into that water okay mm -hmm. the water has been around for a long long time it's like the uh, akashic records of that area it holds on to holy history and you know uh, the understanding of the site and the lands uh, surrounding it but over the course of time, despite, especially in the UK, the replenishment of water coming down through, you know, rainfall that should be filling up the, the streams and the aquifers, it doesn't seem to be doing that. It's almost like the waters are receding back into the safety and into, into the womb of uh, Gaia. This could be because of, um, it could be because of some form of manipulation, or it could be because the, the waters no longer want to interact with us. You know, maybe they're being fed up of being polluted. Maybe they're being fed up of being uh, fracked, you know, for, for a cheap, dirty uh, pound or dollar. Mm -hmm. So I really do feel that the waters of the earth are, are dipping downwards and um, receding back into more hopefully into a more uh, safety conscious zone especially with how we've abused this element yeah. continually since the industrial era going back hundreds of years is clear right right and actually you uh, you have said it the water holds the earth's memory this is this is the, this is something that most people agree with now because of um, emoto's work Lots of people have, have put from various angles, whether it's your angle or, or some other angle, have put enough data together that most, I think, people will not argue anymore that water holds memory, that water is sentient in its, in its way, which is probably more sentient than we are in lots and lots of ways. Um, and so for me, I liked, I liked the idea that it can take charge of itself. It can get away from a threat in a way. Um, because, and I don't think, when Maria said this to me, it was the first time I'd ever thought of that. And, and I, it makes me feel um, quite glad. It makes me feel quite glad to think that water can get away from the things that's not just completely victimized, that at some point it will have had enough. And it makes me think of um, Fukushima, perhaps, as the turning point, Maria. Um, what's going on? And, and, and yes, it's going on in the Pacific, but as you have said, the water, you know, if you understand the water cycle, when something happens in the Pacific, it's happening to the Atlantic, it's happening to the stream behind your house, it's happening everywhere. It, it isn't contained in the Pacific. Sooner or later, and probably sooner, it disperses. It's the nature of water. It's just, this is the nature of water. So, um, the, the ungodly demonic things that are going on in the Pacific with radiation, you know, that may be what's pushed it over the edge. I don't know. But it's also beautiful to think that it can retreat inside the earth and heal itself, maybe retreat to the sacred, the truly sacred levels of water. The elementals, the undines probably have, oh, imagine, imagine 
what's going on there in terms of healing the water that may be retreating under the ground. This is what the undines are for, isn't it, Maria? It's mm -hmm. to, to care for anything that flows, whether it's a tear that falls or a sap in a plant or water in, in the ocean. So, so yeah, I really did, um, I did, I really did want everyone to hear that, that what, what she was saying about water and the water receding and perhaps, and also it resonated with me because I, my postulate that, um, very like <clears throat> the water which actually the earth may be taking back into herself you know there's probably a component of that as well right yeah you see in terms of like esoteric water dowson uh, as well cara is everything is interconnected there is no separation so you so you could have for example some very very deep yin water that's water born within the womb of gaia in Ohio for, for it for example mm -hmm. and you could have some in New York and then you could go across the pond you have these uh, spiral patterns that register that's uh, that's deep in water but they're also connected by an energy spiral that's a bit like a half between a lay and half between a spiral that links all of the deep water so they're all connected so they're connected by this very fine form of, uh, of energy so they know what's happening from Ohio to London to to Russia to to wherever there they are all all interconnected energetically speaking and any um, good esoteric water diviner could, uh, to, could show you that, that kind of energy point and how it links to, to another source of water so this is why it, it's really good that the, those that are awake start to treat the, the water whether it's their their bath water whether it's a lake with some kind of respect and deep love because you know we have uh, taken this element for granted for for many many years but our distant and remote ancestors didn't no absolutely not and i wonder as well before we move just one more thing before we move on because you know, the reason this res one of the reasons this resonates with me is because I'm thinking in my brain, it, you know, the parallel between the earth actually, this um, agreement, let's say it's an agreement between the earth and the Fae itself when they decided to retreat, but the earth also decided to take them in and protect them. It, it's a mutual thing. And so when you said the water was receding, I thought, well, and maybe the earth is actually taking it too, you know, and saying, come, come back, you know. Uh, you can no longer be out there and it would have taken the water and the earth a very long time and they would have put up with unbelievable unbelievable assaults because there are animals that live in that water you know and and there would have been a lot of hesitancy to say like remove but the animals are, are getting the same you know attack that the water is getting so what's the point at this point that needs to be healed it needs to be healed so uh, thank you for that because um I like to think that water gets it can get away from all of this. Anyway, then the other thing that we want to talk about is the trip. We want to talk about this journey, this solstice journey that we're taking in June, June 17th to June 23rd. And Maria has said that she would walk us through it a little bit. So let's listen up. Well, the great thing about this tour is we're going to go to some of the finest megalithic sites of, of Ireland. We're going to go to some of the known sites like Newgrange and Noth. They are wonderful sites. They're a little bit touristy, but, you know, they have their own wonderful uh, vibration. And then we're going to go to some not so well known uh, sites, which are absolutely fantastic. But if I start with Newgrange, because Newgrange is probably Ireland's best known megalithic site. It was reconstructed in, in the 60s, and maybe wrongly so, because what the archaeologists did on the frontispiece of Newgrange, they literally stuck the, the white quartz crystal onto that. And it's now believed that the white quartz crystal probably went over the top, created ah. the car. Yeah? Okay, okay. But it has megalithic artwork that is absolutely stunning, and it has what's called the triple spiral, and I'm wearing my triple spiral Irish... Uh, pendant. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So it has this uh, triple uh, spiral, and researchers have long known that it was aligned the the sun when it rises at midwinter. It aligns to the passageway and it illuminates 
the corridor, filling the chambers with beautiful morning sunlight. That's, that's long, long been known, and that's what New Grange is famous for. But other researchers like Christopher Knight and Robert uh, Lomez, they noticed that there were some eight markings on the inside of New Grange that could represent the transits of Venus, for example. So it could have a very uh, relationship with that planet. And other uh, researchers uh, in Ireland, uh, such as uh, James Swagger, he was a very good uh, researcher, that is for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. He noticed that the triple spiral, could a uh, double spiral tends to represent the equinox. So if we imagine a double spiral is the equinox, but the, the triple spiral of Newgrange could represent Sirius. Because what was noted was that on the, the triple spiral pattern, you've got like a kind of vertical central line that comes down. If you use that as a marker point, then Sirius starts to rise at the same time as the sun. So as the sun comes up, Sirius will come up. And our ancient ancestors must have known this stellar alignment. Yeah. And it will kind of move from the left, the Sirius rising, and gradually and gradually and gradually and gradually it will hit that central line. And when Sirius aligns with that central line on the frontispiece of the stone outside, it also targets a very smaller reproduction of the tri-spiral, that's a triple spiral, on the inside, inside of the mound itself. Mm -hmm. So the spiral pattern could uh, represent Sirius itself. So there's far more to Sirius that goes on. It links us to the uh, triple star system of Sirius itself, mm -hmm. which is an absolutely world wonder of a stellar uh, arrangement within, within Ireland. Yep. Now Sirius, Maria, I hate to interrupt your flow here, but um, isn't Sirius, hasn't there been some postulate that Sirius is actually the second sun for us? Am I right or wrong? Yeah, I have heard heard that. Whether that is an a actual uh, fact, uh, astronomical fact, I, I, I truly don't know. But when we look at it from a symbolic level, it is the second sun because as the sun comes up over Newgrange, so does Sirius. And wow. it's been ascertained that that's the kind of, it marks the procession of mm -hmm. Sirius. Mm -hmm. yeah? wow. And the yearly counter of that counting in years of procession is, mm -hmm. is marked by the midwinter annual alignment. So that was used as, as a counter. Right. But, but the thing about uh, New Grange is all archaeologists tend to say it's all about death. It's all about putting bones into these um, chambers. It's all about putting cremation ashes into these chambers. Mm -hmm. But it isn't. These chambers are so full of living earth energy that can change our consciousness, that can awaken us, yeah. that can, you know, we can tap into because of the underground water uh, at Newgrange. We can tap into the past and the present and the future because time uh, is a linear. It's, uh, it's in a great circle. Right. So there's many things we can work with at Newgrange in Ireland. Yeah, which reminds me actually briefly, uh, the last few days as I've been doing my run, um, I've heard on I've heard a blurb on the BBC. Some woman are getting ready to put out a new yet another documentary on Egypt, talking about the kings being buried in the tombs. And I was, I keep thinking, no, stop saying that. <laughs> That's not what it is. Uh, uh, absolutely. So, so on one day on our trip, uh, Cara, we're going to experience the energies of Newgrange. Yep. Then we're going to experience the energies of Noth, which has contains Ireland's finest artwork on the 97 curbstones that go on the outside of one great mound alone, which is absolutely uh, spectacular. Yeah. So those two sites, you know, we are really going to explore in depth. We're going to have a go at dousing for water energy. We're going to have a go for dousing some earth energy and some lays as well. By the way, I've done that with Maria and it's a lot of fun. Dousing <laughs> 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 water with Maria is kind of a, it's a hoot. I will say that. 
He once did me a very large favor. A few years ago, when I was still teaching, I had a classroom full of 24 children, and I desperately wanted to bring them to her. And um, so she did. She took them all through Avebury, and she showed them all how to some of the earth energies, and she showed them all how to douse, and then she watched me chase 24 kids around, which I think was quite the crack up for her. But <laughs> anyway, go on. So anyway, yes, we're going to be learning to douse. Fantastic. Yeah, so it, it, that that'll be a really like you say it's going to be it's going to be fun. It's going to be uh, interactive, and uh, it's going to be a, a good experience. Then we're going to go to some some other sites that you know they're not so well known. Yeah, and uh, one spectacular site is called Caro Keel. Yeah, okay. it's Cairns three major Cairns, and by that I mean if you imagine these huge like mounds that come over like a semicircle on the top of the ground and inside of these mounds which are topped with white quartz yeah so they they glint the sun and the moonlight you're you're uh, you're looking at white quartz and when we go inside of these cans of karakil mm -hmm. they are white quartz boxes and they have smoothed off white polished uh, quartz. Now, I'm just going to get up for one moment and I'm going to get two pieces of quartz, one of which came from the Karakil Mountains, ah. and show you what, what the kind of uh, quartz is going to be like. This is a piece of uh, white quartz and this is another piece of white quartz. Now, if we imagine something between the two, yeah. That's what you're entering. You're going to be entering this white crystal box. Wow. And it is absolutely astonishing. What's the energetics then when you go into the, I mean, how does that, how does that affect your body? Well, well, uh, greatly so. So when we, we go, if you imagine that we're going to go from the ordinary everyday perception with our senses having an everyday perception yeah like we're now we're using our sight we're using our hearing etc mm -hmm. and when you enter these white quartz chambers then your senses become very heightened yeah it's almost like your hearing becomes a little bit more pronounced your, your senses even when you touch uh touch the side of the quartz your your hands will start to tingle your mm -hmm. You, you feel um, the energy of the quartz, the, en the um, earth energy beneath uh, the mound itself. Mm -hmm. And for those that like to sound tone, can sound tone. And then we go from one of the, the quartz boxes and chambers to the other. But if you imagine on the side of a mountainside, these beautiful quartz uh, um, energy centers, as I'd rather call them than, again, a death chamber. Right. Yeah. Wow. Then what our ancients did, they had in, in Welsh, it, she was known as the goddess Dawn, uh, it was Dana, uh, you know, she has many names, the, the great uh, goddess. Mm -hmm. And in the sky, she's often represented uh, in Celtic astrology as the Greek Cassiopeia, yeah? But we would see in Celtic terms, the great goddess Dawn or the, the great goddess Dana. Uh, and these chambers, the entrance point, the passageways at midwinter, again, at midwinter was a very significant day in Ireland. As uh, uh, Cassiopeia reaches these chambers, they all align to the stars of Cassiopeia, bringing in goddess energy into the site from a stellar perspective. So they were literally the goddess Dawn, Cassiopeia, bringing heaven to earth in, in a mountainous range. And the quartz, if you imagine when sunlight hits quartz or moonlight hits quartz or stellar energy hits uh, quartz, it really does activate the whole of, uh, whole of the chambers. And we're going to be in Ireland at a time when our ancient Celtic ancestors said the veil between this world and the next grows thin. And that's round about the time of mid, um, um, the summer solstice, which is the 21st of June. Mm -hmm. And then three days later, you have Midsummer's Day. 
and Midsummer's Eve. So we're going to be uh, in Ireland together for the summer solstice and for um, Midsummer's uh, Eve and Midsummer's Day as well. They're, they're different. People often mix up those dates and they're, they're separate independent dates. So yeah, Karakil, I would say to people, Google, Google Karakil and it's going to whet your appetite to say, you know, hey, I want to go there. <laughs> C-A-R-R-O-W-K-E-E-L. There you go. Now you can do it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It's the perfect time to be there. And if the veil is thinning and thinning and thinning and thinning, then yeah, it's a perfect time to go and talk about the fae while we're there as well, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, uh, so what are we going to do on the solstice, though? Maria has plans. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the summer solstice has to be uh, celebrated. And uh, it's going to be sort of like when, when the sun actually links into the, the sign of uh, cancer, astrologically speaking, when it's at nor degrees, that's when you have the, uh, the summer solstice and that will happen around about 11 o'clock. Uh, in the morning. So we're going to make sure that we're in the right place at the right time to experience that uh, incoming of that energy at a wonderful, wonderful uh, site called Creevy Keel. Now, Creevy Keel, again, it's a mixture of local sandstone that's embedded with quartz crystal. Yeah. And it's like this huge, long, uh, uh, passage grave is that again is always talking about death but if we imagine that these are chambers and they are alive and um, full of energy we're going to be experiencing a ceremony uh, at uh, Creevy Keel Khan uh, or passage tomb as it's a court tomb as it's often referred to archaeologically speaking but metaphysically uh, speaking, yeah, this is full of uh, feminine energy. It's a very, very feminine place. You've got a lot of yin water there uh, being crossed by female earth currents and energy associated with, with the divine feminine. So it will really, really kind of allow us to merge and bring out the divine feminine whether you're male or female within that site it certainly enhances a lot of people's intuition and sixth sense some people say that they feel a, a complete awakening of their their brow or their third eye chakra after interacting with these energies and it's aligned east west and it's a it's a beautiful um gentle energy but in the gentleness of the divine feminine energy there it is very very powerful mm -hmm, mm -hmm. can i ask you because yes they always talk about these things as death you know burials tombs death decay corpses you know this is the visuals you get but in fact maria aren't they probably more likely initiation mystery school areas when they talk about death, are they not talking about perhaps a passage to another um, consciousness in, um, in the mystery school? I mean, the Hibernian mystery schools were, you know, they were there forever, weren't they? Oh, you keep talking. I've got to plug my machine in because I'm that kind of a person. Keep talking. Yeah, so yes, I mean, I, I agree. I think that these uh, ancient sites, some of them were to initiate us into the higher consciousness and into the, the esoteric, into the mysteries uh, of life and of death. I mean, there's one site in, way, um, in, yeah, in Ireland, actually, called uh, Oe Nagats, the Cave of Cats, yeah? It's often referred to. Now, when we think of ancient sites, we often think of sites above the ground because we see Stonehenge, Newgrange, Creevy Kill, where we're going, they're all above the ground. But our ancient ancestors also created monuments deep within the ground, that which is below. And Oe Nagat is below uh, the ground. And if you imagine there's one way of entering through a chamber in the ground, you have to actually slide into Oe Nagat like this, and then you enter a chamber, and then you go down and down to about sort of 20, 30 feet, very, very deep within the earth. And then suddenly, magically, it opens up to a chamber, cathedral-like space, 
with some, they call it a natural cave, but there's some of this stonework is clearly being dressed or worked mm. to make smooth by ancient man. The acoustics are astonishing. And uh, it is it is actually a sight to behold. But in back in the day of the Bronze Age and the Druidic period when this was being used, you would go in one way and come out the other, like a rebirth, a regeneration. You know, what an initiate might go through to understand the deeper mysteries of life and death, uh, etc. So, and they do change us. I mean, this is the thing. Ancient sites are there to change us and maybe this is why places like Karnak, Stonehenge, we the, were denied access, restricted access to these sites because they are a game, a game changer and they've been a game changer leading up to 2012 uh, on their cycles like when they become really power based and powerful was you know uh, around the, the the 2012 date mark for our experiences right so there's these uh, this is you know this is one of those things they are so meant for us that we only have to be there to be affected deeply deeply affected because it's just like a sister energy it's there to activate yeah isn't it yeah, yeah. okay yeah. great and then what yeah, and I'd just like to add about Creevy Keel uh, as well. It's uh, situated quite close to a holy well, and uh, water and, you know, the deep waters are associated with it, and it's very, very healing as well. It has one particular chamber that a lot of people have experienced uh, healing, you know, within that chamber. So I would say it's a very healing place. And sometimes when we have that quiet moment of just, you know, closing our eyes and sort of, tune into the energies of the site it's literally makes you feel like you're being enveloped in an energy that is caring and like like our mother would hold us it is it is truly extraordinary yeah i can't wait for that that's for sure i know you know where every drop of sacred water in ireland is so <laughs> so yay okay um if it won't pull you off the topic too much um, and it might, if it does, to say so. But what I know you've been doing a lot of work on the idea of giants. Have you not? Sorry, Cara, your, your sound's going. That's okay. You've been doing a lot of work on the idea of giants. I wonder if uh, some of this is taking you to Ireland. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh, see, this is what happens. Ugh. Okay, let me try. Let me just. Try getting closer. Does that help? That's a bit better, yeah. Okay. Giants. Talk giants. Giants. You and your work in giants. Um, I know you've discovered some giants underground. I know you have. Um, have you been doing any work on, on that in Ireland? It might be off topic for you a little bit, but um, I just wanted to ask you. Well, that's right. I mean, there's been quite a few people working on giants uh, and writing about them, you know, like uh, Ross Hamilton in America and Hugh Newman uh, in the UK. And I've, I've noticed some, uh, an antiquarian report of a 13 foot giant around the Stonehenge and Byrons. And, and Ireland has often been associated with giants and giants and people that could move and transport stone quite easily. In fact, it was in one myth with Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, who wrote the histories of the kings of uh, Britain, that, you know, the stones of Stonehenge were transported from, from Ireland. They're actually transported from Wales. Uh, but it's, it's the mythology uh, being quite accurate, the holy history saying that they were transported from, from one place. And in, in Ireland's own mythological past, there have been races of giants. There's been some extraordinary uh, supernatural beings associated with, uh, with, with, with the area. So yes, I think that the giants are all a, all a part of that, uh, that history that Ireland is rich in. Definitely. Okay, I didn't want to get too far off, uh, too far off topic there, but um, for some reason it just came to my mind. So anyway, let's go back to our travels. Where are we? Are we between the solstice 
and St. John's Eve. Yeah, or we won't call it St. John's Eve. Let's call it Midsummer. That's better, right? Yeah, Midsummer, and that, that's when the veil is at its thinnest between uh, those times, which is really ascertained by the, the sun's movement, the sun's annual movement, because mm -hmm. it reaches its solstice, meaning yeah. sun still, sun stands still at the, uh, the summer solstice, and it will stay there for, you know, about three days mm -hmm. to mid, mid, uh, Midsummer's Day, and then it starts to head south, and the days will get shorter, and the nights will get longer after that time. So it was at a pinnacle point where the veil between this world and the next uh, grows thin. And one of the site that we're going to go and interact with is uh, a really beautiful, remarkable site called Grianon. And uh, Grianon is, if you imagine, it's history going way, way back to the Druidic uh, priesthood and some would say even earlier to the the bronze megalithic age but you know the jury's out on that i actually think it's probably goes way way back even before that yeah. but uh, to use the archaeological timeline we call it a druidic uh, center it's uh wow it's a huge circle of stonework that is walls that are about 16 or so feet high by uh, 15 feet wide, making this pure circle of three terraces that you can go up to. And at, right at the bottom, you have at this time of the year a very small doorway, and where we must put a picture up of uh, Grianon. Uh, and the door is aligned to the equinoxes when a sun shaft enters Grianon. Okay. And splits it in two with a beam of beautiful sunlight that hits the far wall. So I want people to imagine that there's this circle, this huge circle, which is 800 feet elevated on elevated ground. Uh, all dry stone walling, no mortar used at all. We're going to be interacting with the energies of uh, Griana and we're going to be cleansing our own body waters there. We're going to be listening to you talking about the, the Fae and, uh, and your uh, work and uh, contribution. Amid this ancient Druid site will be a magical experience. When I went there, I just went, wow. <laughs> Wow. That's fantastic. Great. Yeah, Maria's actually going to be doing this whole thing with Maria. It's going to be like a, a, a water workshop, a sacred water workshop, because she, as she's taking us through these things, it's like, what, an eight-day water workshop in a way. And I'm really thrilled to be able to get the chance to do my stuff as well. So uh, it's, it's transformative. There's no question. We're all going to come through this, and out the other side, transform at a fundamental level and that and we're going at that time of year do they jump the fire there this is the first place in, in here once i moved here it was the first place i ever jumped the fire anywhere for midsummer do you that's the, that's a tradition like a beltane as well you used to drive your cattle through the uh fire uh, and uh, a Samhain, that would be another time. You know, there they are fire festivals of the ancient uh, Celt, Celtic people. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, this is, and I will find a picture, or she was, she'll send me a picture of Brianna. Is Brianna the name of an entity by any chance? Because it sounds like it is. I'm not sure. That would be uh, certainly something that uh, to research. Mm -hmm. I'm going yeah. to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is. It was at one time the seat of the kings of uh, royal Ireland and Ulster, for example, uh, uh, Griana. And uh, but prior to that, I think it was more like a druidic core. And a core, C O R, is a college, a place okay. of learning, which. Um, the, the, the ancients used to create these places so that people obviously could go and study astronomy, geomancy, yeah. and, you know, and uh, the mystical and the magical arts. And even today, when we look back to places like Oxford University, mm -hmm. they are cited over an ancient Druidic core. Right. Because the energies there encourage us to retain information, to learn and to grow and to evolve. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's why Oxford University is cited where it is. 
There you go. So after we leave, Grianon, where are we headed? Well, that's heading towards the, the end of the tour. So if we backtrack a little bit to when we're going to be in a place called Sligo. Yep. Sligo is a wonderful part of Ireland. It's uh, more on the west uh, coast because we're going to be starting off in Dublin, which is more in the east, and we're going to be journeying towards Sligo. What's special about Sligo? Well, it's very special because it has, this, uh, it has this bay, this natural bay. And some researchers have noticed this. If in the time of Atlantis, when Atlantis sunk, as Plato has reported many, many, many years ago. Now, if we follow what Plato said and Atlantis went down, and let's say some survivors of Atlantis were able to have access to a boat, but they haven't got any oars. That's been long lost in the, you know, the, the fray of what was going on. Okay. But let's, for example, imagine that people were able to get into the boat. Where would the natural currents take them? And it's been ascertained by researchers uh, into tidal movements, tidal currents, etc., that you would land at Sligo. Yeah. So it's no mistake that the oldest monument in the British Isles that predate Stonehenge and other places by over one and a half thousand years are found in Sligo. And that's Carrickeel, Creevykeel and Carramore, which we will be uh, going to in Sligo. So these could these predate any other uh, in the British Isles, especially places like Stonehenge. Right. You know, a lot of people just put the same dates on all of these megalithic sites, but right. Ireland is the oldest. Mm -hmm. It is. And I will be doing a massive amount of Fay work there then because the Fay predate everyone and everything. Well, that would be, be wonderful. Were you in the right part of the world to do that? Absolutely. Now, is there anything else you want to say about that other than I'm doing the registration for this. Maria has said this to me, and I'm fine with that because, you know, I have to tell you, my friend Maria is really busy. She's, she's got all kinds of things going on all the time. So if you want to hear more about it, uh, you can contact me on Facebook. I'm very available there. Or go to worldlectures at AOL.com. Send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the uh, information that you need. Um, and we it will sell out. Maria's stuff always does. So that's FYI. If you want to go to Ireland with Maria, we, we better start making plans. And I would if I mean, it's going to be a fantastic trip. So the other thing... Unless Maria has something more she wants to say about the trip, do you? Well, I'd just like to add uh, about the trip. What is special uh, about this this trip uh, is that, you know, Kara's um, uh, research to do with the Fay, which is, you know, uh, so linked with, with Ireland and, uh, and with the sites. It will make research come alive. It will take you away from the book. It will take you away from the knowledge base. It will take you out of your left brain and put you in the right brain by experiencing. Because we live in a virtual world half the time now. Right, right. absolutely. So I think this will take us away from our ordinary everyday lives, our virtual lives, and put us in the uh, ancient sites amid uh, the, the, the magic of the megaliths. Yep, and I've recently been advising people to put their feet in the grass post post eclipse really important right now what a hell of a place to put your feet in the grass wouldn't it that's what i think i can't Absolutely. wait i'd like to do, i'd like to do the whole tour barefoot actually maybe i will okay anyway <laughs> i'm gonna hit her with something i haven't told her about yet so if she if she doesn't want to talk about it that's fine but when your, your, your sounds going again a bit sorry, every time i have something i want to hit, hit you with that's not uh I haven't told you about my sound system. Maybe that's your guardian. <laughs> okay. When, let me know if you can hear me. Can you hear me, Maria? Yeah, I can hear okay. you. All it right. Going in and out. Oh, God. Okay. Well, let's see how this goes then. Just before the eclipse, I went to Germany. I wasn't planning on going to Germany. Um, to a little town in the mountains near a place called Kassel. It wasn't in Kassel, south of Kassel. And I discovered that during that trip, I was sitting on top of an Earth Guardian crystal the size of a London double-decker bus. Wow. Just, wow. I am just under my room. I couldn't believe it. The man who owns 
Uh oh, there you go. The man who owns the this place asked me if I felt anything special about the area, and I went down and I I, I, I looked around and there was a tree, a horse chestnut tree, sitting on the side of the stream, and I said, "What is something about this tree?" Sure. And he said, "It's sitting on top of uh, an earth guardian crystal, the size of a London double decker bus." And I said, "Oh my God." Anyway, so for the eclipse. I was actually sitting out in the middle of nowhere on top of that crystal, and there was there's no cell phone reception there on this mountain. And the night of the eclipse, all the electricity went out too. Wow! So I actually feel <laughs> that I was not in the eclipse. <laughs> I actually think that I was absent from the eclipse, probably with a note from the bay. Anyway, I thought I hadn't had a chance to tell Maria about this crystal, and I don't know what she may be able to say about these sorts of crystals in general, but I'm wondering if she knows something about them. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the magical thing about stone and, uh, and crystal is that uh, if we kind of see silicon chips born of silicon valley uh, and they have they can receive energy and they can give off energy they're they're a, a, a semiconductor little chip yeah mm -hmm. now if you look at a crystal and you look at a standing stone at stonehenge or, or wherever or the rock that that you know you're you're sat on if you look in inside of that crystal the lattice crystal structure is identical to the little chip there's a hardly any difference so, so these uh, these people would just say rocks. These these absolutely amazing uh, crystals and stones can re receive energy and uh, and transmit it. And just like water, Cara, just like water, uh, uh, any crystal or or standing stone or rock that is situated above underground water, especially yin water, or on a lay, etc. You know, in an energy system of Gaia's then they begin to transmit to the next stone. Or just like water would flow right. from a spring to the ocean, that's its destination, that's its destiny. Same with crystals and standing stones. So especially if it's a guardian stone, it can receive your information, it can give information, you can become a part of it, you can become one with it, and it will be transmitting your, any information to, to the other stone. So it's a bit like, how tree roots all interact and become one. Right. The, the stones and uh, the crystals are like one big giant family that's constantly communicating. And if we can tap into that, yeah. if we can tap into that in a moment of a window of our time, then we can receive and give information as well. It's a wonder of, uh, an ancient wonder of how stones are two sentience. Right. Somebody's buzzing my door. I wonder. Yashka's out at the allotment. I wonder if she's left her keys. Anyway, I will tell you though, I cannot lose, I cannot shake the image of this place where I was on top of that crystal. So I have to assume it, it you know, it, um, I've, I've attached myself to it somehow. You know what I mean? All right, I have to walk to the door. Come with me, Maria. I'll come with you. <laughs> Yasha having forgot his keys. It is Yasha having for okay everybody. I want to go. Ready? You ready, Maria? It's always Yasha. Hi. <laughs> My husband. Come with me, everyone. Oh Maria. Maria knows Yasha. She's probably not. <laughs> right. So you're now in the interview, Yasha. How do you like that? Oh, thanks. She says, carry on. <laughs> okay, Maria, that's fine. People love the uh, home attack. Anyway, okay, so this probably is a good place to end it. Yeah? Um, or even just before that. <laughs> can you hear me? No, you've you faded out again, Cara. All right. Anyway. I can see beautiful flowers, though. Yeah, I got them from the allotment the guy okay so thank you for this very much for this i'm going to get it done and put it up and everybody tune up everybody look for her book contact me for the trip 
ask us questions. Maria's very receptive on Facebook as well. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Maria. I know you're very busy. So I'll see you very soon. You're welcome. Bye-bye.